So once you have your patient properly positioned and ready to take a blood pressure, you want to start with the first step of the blood pressure um, reading. So the first thing that you wanna do and the first step of this is um, a step that some of you who are familiar with taking blood pressure or have ever seen a blood pressure uh, or had a blood pressure taken on themselves may not be a familiar uh, uh, method of doing this. But there is a good rationale for this. Uh, if you have any experience with taking blood pressure, um, I would ask you, how high do you pump up the cuff? So how high do you pump it up for every patient? And in my years of doing this, I had students tell me, oh, I was told to go to 220, and oh, well, if they're small, only go to 180, or oh, I go up to at least 260 or 280. Um, and what do we know? We know that blood pressure cuffs, not only if they're pumped too high, can hurt, um, but we also know that it can alter the blood pressure reading itself. So we wanna make sure that we are super accurate. The um, other layer of knowing this first step in this, in this technique of doing a two-step method is that if you are ever getting a reading that is truly abnormal, you can always fall back to this step one as a, as a safe, as a uh, safe measure, almost like a, a, to check yourself and make sure, like, wow, is that is that systolic really 80? Hold on. And if you do that, this first step of this blood pressure, you can kind of reassure yourself that you are getting a number that maybe is a little uh, abnormally low or maybe abnormally high. Okay, so the first step of the blood pressure is we are going to take the cuff that we have measured for the patient to make sure that it is the right size. We're gonna line up the marker with the brachial artery. The brachial artery runs underneath, inside, just below that bicep muscle and comes around right at the antecubital fossa, which is the bend of the elbow, the inner the, um, bend of the elbow. It comes just to the, the side where the bicep is. And if you place your fingers, you'll feel that tendon that runs down, like that tight rope that runs down. You put your fingers just on the side of it, you should be able to feel that uh, brachial pulse nicely. Okay, and once you do, you wanna line up that marker with where you felt the artery the best. So I feel the artery the best right about here, so I'm gonna line that up. I want about an inch space when I'm putting this on, so I need an inch between the bend of that arm, the bend of the elbow, and the cuff, so I wanna move it up a little bit. And then I'm going to wrap it around and make sure that I do not have any material at all that is any clothing that's underneath the cuff. I also wanna make sure that it has a nice firm, um, uh, it's firmly wrapped around it. We don't want it too loose because that can also alter the blood pressure readings. And then you just wanna figure out where you wanna put your sphygmomanometer. There are loops that you can put on. You can you know, brace them, you can kind of play with your blood pressure cuff that you have at home. Um, I'm standing on this side of the patient, so it doesn't make much sense to put it on that side, so I won't be able to see it. So you can get a little creative. The one thing you wanna make sure of, though, is that you never put this metal clip between the patient and the blood pressure cuff. Because remember, as we increase the pressure and add air to it, it's gonna tighten up on the arm, and we don't want this digging into the patient's arm um, and cause, cause them injury. Um, additionally, we don't wanna clamp this on the bladder itself because that will alter the reading that you get as well. So I'm just gonna get a little creative and just give myself a little tab. And then get this situated here. Okay, so for the first step, you do not need a stethoscope, okay? All we need is the radial pulse and we need our bulb so that we can inflate it. So we wanna take our valve and just turn it so that it's snug, okay? You do not want this valve too tight. Um, I will tell you the uh, tip here is that uh, an accurate, taking an accurate blood pressure, a lot of it has to do with the finesse of the valve, okay? So you just want it snug, and actually this uh, bulb is kind of coming off, so I'm just pushing it back on a little bit, okay? Um, so you want it just so it, it meets resistance, and then I'm gonna feel for my radial artery and you wanna make sure that you feel it nice and strongly before you start. So I've got a nice strong radial pulse, okay. So what I'm gonna be doing here is I'm feeling this radial pulse and then I'm gonna start pumping up my cuff and I am watching the uh, sphygmomanometer, I'm watching the needle and seeing how high I'm pumping up, but I'm also feeling for that radial pulse and I'm feeling for the radial pulse to completely go away. Once that radial pulse has gone away, I'm gonna give it a 
slight little extra pump and then I'm going to slowly start releasing the valve. As I start to slowly release the valve, the sphygmomanometer, the actual gauge itself, will start to lower and as soon as I feel that radial pulse come back into the radial arteries, the very first pulsation that I feel, I want to note what that gauge was on, what the number was on the gauge as it was. So you have to kind of bring in all your senses here. You're feeling, you're doing your tactile, moving this around, but then you are watching your gauge so that you can remember the number that it comes back as soon as you feel that um, pulse. So again, feel for the radial pulse to go completely away, give it a little extra pump, and then slowly start to release the air. You no longer need to put any more air into it, just slowly start to open up the valve, release the air very slowly. As soon as you feel that pulse, that is gonna be your um, the number you want to remember. So I'm gonna do this on you. So I don't feel it anymore. I'm going to start to slowly release the air. Okay, and I felt it come back at 112. Okay, so 112 is now the number that is my estimated systolic uh, blood pressure. Now with that keyword is estimated. So when I go to do my second step, which is the more familiar step that you're used to, when I do that step, I should get a systolic that's somewhere around the 112 region, okay? So again, this is the first step. But what's great about this is you have an estimated systolic, you know what to expect, so you're not gonna miss, um, you know, this, this fine gentleman here might have a blood pressure of 220 and I wouldn't know it. If I didn't pump up the cuff high enough on the second step, I might miss that. So this first step ensures that you're going to get a solid systolic number. You know where you're gonna expect it. So we're gonna take that 112 and we're gonna add about 30 to it. And that's what we're gonna pump up to. So once you have let your patient rest between step one and step two, um, and by the way, this is a great time during that rest time to get other vital signs. So you can collect a respiratory rate, a heart rate, um, and then by the time you're done with that, you've given enough uh, time for the uh, blood pressure in the artery to reacclimate. Okay, so now we're ready for the second step. So we took the number, which was 112. We're going to add about 30 to 40 to that. So we're going to go up to about 142, 152. Um, and here's the thing is that it's not an exact science, so I'm gonna go up to about 150. Again, adding that 30 um, milligrams of mercury to it gives us the cushion to be able to release the valve and give us a second to get our ears set so we're listening for that very first carotid cough sound. When you hear that very first carotid cough sound, so that very first bump, okay, that first thump, that very first sound is your is your systolic, okay? So you have to be paying attention, you have to be super focused and listening because sometimes you think you hear it, but it may not be, like you talk yourself out of it because you think it's artifact or some other sound. So you really need to be paying attention um, and that 30 to 40 milligrams of mercury cushion that you're giving yourself, you're kind of setting yourself up to anticipate that first thump. Okay, because it, again, it should be somewhere around the 112, but 99% of the time it's not the exact, it's not, uh, I should say 90% of the time it's not the exact estimated systolic, okay? So now for the second, um, blood pressure cuff is still in place. I look, make sure that that is still aligned, um, which I can probably turn this just a smidge. Get a little bit more aligned. Okay, and again, a nice firm wrap on it. Okay, and I get my gauge all set. So I've got that, and for the second step, I am gonna need my stethoscope. So I'm gonna take this out, and I am gonna be placing this. I'm gonna use the diaphragm. Um, it, you could use your bell as well, um, but remember that when you're using the bell side of it, this is for low pitch sounds, you need to place it very lightly and um, sometimes doing this one with one hand, holding the stethoscope with one hand, um, and that that actually prohibits you from really using this lightly. You kind of have to 
use some pressure. So even if you push down on the diaphragm, it's gonna, or push down on using the belt, it's gonna turn into a diaphragm. The diaphragm will pick out these sounds with no problem. So that's what you're gonna see most uh, professionals, healthcare professionals use the diaphragm with the stethoscope. So I am gonna make sure that this stethoscope is right over top of where I felt that artery. So again, feel for it, make sure that you can feel it. If you can't feel it, it means you're not gonna hear it well. So a tip in making sure that you can hear Karotkov sounds the best is to palpate, make sure you have that artery, you feel it, it feels great, you wanna go right over top of where that artery is, okay? Right over top of where that pulsation is that you're feeling, okay? So, I'm gonna go ahead and put my step, my earpieces on. This is gonna go right over top of the artery, and I am going to be pumping up to about 150, um, and I'm listening for that very first sound for the Karakoff sound, that very first sound, again, is gonna be your systolic reading. The diastolic is, um, is a little bit more challenging. The diastolic is a beat that you're anticipating is always gonna be the last beat. So you're lit literally listening to every single beat. And when you hear the very last beat, that last clear thump, that's gonna be your diastolic number. Um, with some blood pressures, not all pressures you know, are created equally, but, but for some blood pressures, the diastolic will be one last thump and then there's nothing, there's no sounds at all. While some diastolics, you can hear all the way down, you can, you can not even a diastolic, you can hear this sounds, that thumping all the way down into the 30s and 20s. Here's the thing, a patient is not gonna be sitting upright, alert and oriented with a diastolic blood pressure of a 20 or 30, so you know it's not right. With the, those patients, it's gonna be that last clear thump before it gets quick and quiet. So it's gonna turn into like a muffled, quick pulsation. The last one that was clear that you heard, you're anticipating that last one, that's gonna be your diastolic. But again, many people, you're gonna hear that diastolic is the last sound that you hear, and then you can release the rest of the air, okay? So go ahead and get the pressure. So big piece here is that you wanna make sure that your hand is anchored. You can hold your stethoscope like this and anchor it and use counter pressure with your hand to make sure your hand is super still. You can hold your, your stethoscope like this and then push, make sure your other fingers are planted on the arm. This planting of the hand on the arm will help reduce the creaky fingers, what I call the creaky fingers or artifact. If you hold your stethoscope like this and hold it like this, you're gonna get all types of creaky fingers because you just can't hold them still. Your muscles won't allow that to happen. So here, get comfortable and plant your hand, okay? So we're gonna plant it. Um, one thing I want you to be cautious of is that if you do have a stethoscope with this type of open bell or if it has a plastic piece over top of it, you don't want to put your thumb on top of that or in the bell at all because that will also um, pick up your own pulsations in your thumb and create artifact that uh, will make it inaccurate. If you do have one that's got this rubber diaphragm, or I'm sorry, this rubber edging around it, you can bridge your thumb over top of it to where you are not touching the bell, but you're bridging it over top. So that's another kind of trick of the trade too, um, if you wanted to do that. You just wanna make sure that you never put a thumb or your fingers don't go into the bell itself, okay? All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and get myself, I feel my artery here, and I'm pushing down. I wanna make sure that the entire rubber edge of the diaphragm is connecting with the skin. Otherwise, I'm gonna pick up the ambient artifact in the environment. So, sorry, thanks for catching that. All right, so I've got my stethoscope all set. Notice how I am not underneath, I am not touching the cuff. I don't want my stethoscope to touch the cuff. If it is touching the cuff or under the cuff, you need to adjust your uh, cuff to be higher, but you never want this underneath the cuff. Um, I see a lot of bad habits where they tuck it underneath the cuff and then don't touch it at all. But remember that that's gonna create an increased pressure and cut off that blood supply to the arteries sooner than, um, and then cause a false blood pressure reading. So we have it all set. I've got my valve. I'm just snug with it closed and I'm gonna go ahead Get my hands nice and anchored, and I'm gonna start my blood pressure.
So blood pressure was 116 over 64. Um, that was a beautiful blood pressure, great reading. Um, under the 120 over 80, so that's a very good reading. Uh, a couple things that I want to talk about is releasing the air out of the valve. So once you've hit that 150, which is where I was going to for this patient, once I start with that, you have to open up your valve. And again, it's about the finesse of opening this valve. You want to open it super slow. Each tick on this sphygmomanometer, remember, has is two points in between, right? So you want one of those ticks per second. That's how slow the air should be coming out to make sure that it's accurate. Releasing the air too slow or too fast will alter your blood pressure readings. So you wanna make sure you're going nice and slow. But remember, the whole idea behind a blood pressure is allowing the, um, the blood to get back into the artery. And it's gonna match the force of the blood that's being pushed out of the heart onto that arterial wall as soon as that pressure gradient is matched with the pressure you're putting on it from inflating that cuff and stopping the blood flow, it's gonna start bouncing in the same place and it's gonna stop moving. So once you start opening up that valve, okay, you open it up, it starts going slow, you're gonna notice that it starts bouncing on the same number. You've gotta open it just a smidge more. So while you're taking this, you might find that opening it just a smidge more is all you need to get that, that diastolic reading. Um, you might find that you need to open it just a little bit more as it gets a little bit lower to again readjust for that pressure gradient and matching that pressure gradient. So again, the trick of doing this and doing it well is the finesse of opening this valve. The best way to practice this, if you perhaps don't have a patient to do this on, you can actually take your blood pressure cuff, wrap it around the arm of a chair or around the leg of, of a table and work on pumping it up and then releasing it slowly. 